Good afternoon. I'm Mark Allen with Gaber IO, and I'm here today with Jeff August, the Director of Platform Resources at Packet Fabric. Good afternoon, Jeff. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, I'm, I'm. Looks like I got a little more space to me right now than you do, but I, I guess we're both doing okay. I'm in my nerd cave. You're in the Swiss Alps. We're good. Yeah. And if I were to be honest, I'm in a place very similar to you. <laughs> I just choose to hide it. <laughs> so. Can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Yeah, so um, I've been working in Silicon Valley for, uh, you know, since 2006. Um, the notable companies I've spent, you know, considerable time with would be Yahoo. And then after Yahoo, I went to Facebook and Facebook. From there, I went to Square and uh, from Square, I went to Dropbox. And so I kind of think of that as juggernaut alley. I worked on some companies that became really massively huge and I started working there when they really weren't massively huge. So it was an interesting experience by far. Mm -hmm. And pack, Packet Fabric will be the next juggernaut, you think? That, that is, I absolutely believe we have, uh, the market exists for us to become a juggernaut. Now it's all about executing. That's, I wish you well. That is, marketing is so key in this world. <laughs> it is, absolutely. Yes, or else we'd all have Betamaxes right now, right? We would have had Betamaxes. <laughs> so, so Dude, not anymore, right? We, we, we would have cashed them in by now for whatever streaming service we're watching at this point. But this is I, I know what you mean. <laughs> yes. So what has been your experience with remote employment, both as a remote employee and employer? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're interesting. Packet Fabric is... Uh, it, we're, we're around 70 people that work at our company now, and every single one of us uh, is a remote employee. We don't have a corporate office anywhere. And so um, I'm immersed in it. You know, it's, it's day to day. Um, everything that, that happens at our company happens over a similar discussion like this. Um, you know, it's, unless we're at a, uh, all at a conference or something, which as we all know right now, that's not happening for any time soon. So uh, it's like this for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say it's, you know, there's, there's pros to it and there's cons to it. The, probably the biggest pro that I can, you know, say right off the bat is that I, where I work, those other places in Silicon Valley, I live in the East Bay, which is about an hour and a half commute each way, depending on mm -hmm. how, how you get there. If you're driving to somewhere like Palo Alto or Menlo Park, that's going to take uh, quite a quite a bit of time and if you're uh, riding the BART train into San Francisco it's easily an hour and a half no matter oh, what so. and it's brutal I've done it it's just brutal and so in those in those uh, three hours a day that I've gotten back I now get up early and lift weights in uh, in my garage where I've built a personal gym thankfully right now I can still keep working out because I don't have a gym to go to yeah. um, but um, you know you also find that uh, sometimes your day stretches on a little bit longer than what you were used to because you don't have a train to catch and you don't have to try and miss rush hour traffic or you don't have something to get home for. So you have to leave at a certain time. You're already there. Yeah, no, it's nice. It, it, it's funny. I have a friend that doesn't live too far from you and his background is not the Swiss Alps. He actually took a picture of the 580 with no cars on it. <laughs> it it's like the walking dead. It, it's insane. It really is. It's so weird because that's never the case. And, um, you know, like it's, it's, I've watched over, the, you know, I've lived in Pleasanton now for 13 years and I've watched as uh, it's become more and more like Los Angeles where it doesn't matter what time of day you get on 580. It's full of cars. Yes, it is. I mean, on Saturday afternoons, I've been in traffic and Sunday afternoons in traffic jams on the 580. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and I'm over in the other side of the bay, and, and the 101 gets a little bit of that, not quite as bad. Going into the city, we get it, and, and around the airport, uh, but not that. Yeah, I, was, I was thinking about, you know, the 101 and 880 are like sister roads, and yes. then 280 and 680 are the other ones, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I agree. And 580 is just, it's what goes east and west along the Contra Costa and Alameda area. Yep, exactly. So Out over the Altamont Pass. Yes. Oh, yes. So what do you think is the future of remote employment and what do you think can be done differently to make it more effective? Yeah. You know, I, I, I honestly believe that just because of the things we were talking about, um, you know, the, the flexibility for employees and uh, the sort of lack of time constraints, where you don't have to fit these massive super commutes, especially in urban areas like here, you know, joking about the Altamont Pass, 
there's folks that live out in Tracy and work in San Francisco and I know. they would love to have a three hour two way commute. You know, like they, they have at least five hours a day in a car in some of those places. Um, and the opportunity for people to work in these type of environments, it's now being proven, you know, it's, it's science. It was a theory not too long ago. Maybe people could be more productive, work from home. And I remember that being around when I first started my career way back in, let's not age myself right now. But mm -hmm. there was a talk about telecommuting back then, right? And, uh, you know, 25 years ago or whatever it was. And now um, it's been proven. Companies like ours are thriving and building, you know, uh, tens of millions of dollars revenue streams with people who are working essentially like me from an office they built in their garage at home. Yeah. Um, so I feel like, you know, definitely that's the future and it's going to allow some people to, uh, especially these big urban areas um, where transportation is a huge problem. It'll, it'll allow folks to live further away from the core of the urban area. Uh, and it'll, you know, everything like right now, I live in a 1600 square foot house and in, in the core bay on this side of the Altamont Pass in a nice city uh, with a good school district, a 1600 square foot house is, is a, a million dollar plus um, oper you know cost it's not it's not cheap so that's why I have built a, a um, office in my garage because there's no room in the 1600 square foot house for me to build a, a dedicated office for me to work so you know you want to live further out you can go out and in um, Tracy or somewhere like that pay half the price for the house have a double the size of a house and have an office inside your house rather than in your garage so yeah. I, I think you know that that sort of thing is just so enticing um and you know it's another it really ties into the way that silicon valley works in general which is the idea of maslow's hierarchy of needs you know people getting sustenance what they need and as you move up eventually you're you're working on self-actualization which from a business context means you're focusing only on what you have to get done to uh drive your business forward and if if you're able to work from your home and you're and you don't have to worry about these long commutes and all that sort of thing, you're 100 percent dedicated and focused on doing what needs to get done to build the business. And those are the kind of results that are going to drive this uh, a, a much bigger trend. And especially you know with COVID 19 going on, we're watching our children uh, go to school over the internet and they're not having trouble. They're not falling behind. They're getting the stuff they need to get done. Um, it just decentralizing things makes so much more sense. It does. Yeah, and I think the schools had a little bit of an adjustment, but they seem to have done pretty well, especially, you know, the, the, the nicer schools. I think there's still some schools that are having problems. Oh, certainly. You know, I, I, you know, I think I should probably acknowledge when I'm talking about this, that my, the level of privilege that I have in my life, that my children all have uh, their mm -hmm. own vices. And so that's definitely a thing, you know, that's part of the gap is how, how do folks in outlying areas um, function in a way when they don't have maybe access to the same level of technology. Rural bo uh, broadband in our country, this is a huge thing, right? There's, mm -hmm. there just isn't, there's a large parts of our country that don't have the level of broadband that you have in an urban area or a suburban area. And so that makes these kind of opportunities difficult for places like that. And I grew up in a rural area, mm -hmm. uh, down in Central California. So I think about these things a lot. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think two changes that I was thinking about, like, what will be driven? What will happen? I think you'll probably start to see rural broadband being driven by some of this demand for people to live outside of an urban area and work for companies that are in the urban core. And then second, I was thinking it might impact, you know, the design of it, it, things like houses. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, instead of having uh, four bedrooms and, uh, you know, and all with closets and whatever, you might end up with, a small room that's just an office. You actually have a purpose-built office and some new homes that are being built specifically for people who want to work from home. Um, those are those are interesting and fun things to think about. And I, I think actually was predicted in uh, Back to the Future Three way a long time ago. <laughs> you remember that? Really? Wow. Well, uh, Marty McFly was working from home and he got yelled at by his boss uh, <laughs> from his home office, and it was a uh, you know, and he was he was on a talk just like this. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, the only reason I remember that is because I have children and they wanted to watch the Back to the Future series a couple of years back. We watched it. I was like, hey, that is crazy how accurate that actually is. For my life, personally, I know that's Yeah, I remember, I remember, well, didn't, wasn't recently they had the, was the the date that was supposedly the date he went back to the future of? It was like five years ago, right? 
Yeah, there was, <laughs> it was, I actually, this is funny because I was, uh, you know, Facebook memories that pop up and one of them, one of my statuses that popped up the other day, it was actually, I think it was pretty recent. I think it was March something. Mm -hmm. uh, because there was a status that I'd written that I was working on homework with one of my daughters while my younger daughter, I sat her in front of the television to watch Back to the Future and she just yells from the other room, hey guys, on this day in 30 years, we're going to have flying cars. Or no, no, mm -hmm. on this day next year, we're going to have flying cars, you know? So it's just like, oh wow, I didn't even mm -hmm. think about that. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it was recent. Yeah. So uh, tell me the story behind uh, Packet Fabric and, and what's the journey been like? Yeah, so um, we, we're a company that's uh, dedicated and focused on building, I guess we, I think of ourselves as a network automation company, although we're really uh, a network as a service company. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we give customers access to a, uh, a portal. Um, I don't really like that word, but that's the word, you know, it's a portal and you can log into it. And if you're in particular um, data centers that we're in, and we're in around a lot, we're in a lot, it's like 143 at this point, something like mm. that. And if you go into this portal and you say, I'm in this data center and I need 100 gigs of capacity to this data center on the other side of the country, Packet Fabrics in both, you can turn that up yourself within minutes on, a, mm. on an interface. So we're really about automating that sort of network buying experience um, and uh, you know, giving customers uh, the ability to manage their own networks in an easy way. Plus, the other thing that, that's really interesting about what we do is we publish the pricing of everything we sell right on the website. Mm -hmm. So you go to it, you, there's no questions. You know, I want to do this on a month-to-month -month basis. Cool. It's going to cost this amount for you to do this for the next 30 days. I want to do it on a six-month term. Here's what your discount is for doing it on a 36-month term. And it's, and it's all done right out in the open. Interesting. It's funny because I actually know the guys that... that built the visa network which as you, you probably know visas right here in, in my hometown yeah. um and the amount of hardware and the amount of brain power it took to do that and this was years ago yeah right um and now you just say oh i want that <laughs> yeah you know i think like back back when i first started doing i worked at um pacific bell that was my, mm -hmm. my first real job was at pacific bell and uh at the time our big product was something called ISDN, you know, speaking mm -hmm. of like Betamax and whatever, right? that's a, that's a thing that nobody would even remember anymore. Um, just the, <laughs> you know, integrated services, digital network. What does that mean? Well, it's bare channel. It, it's not worth explaining, right? It's been, mm -hmm. it's an obsolete technology for most people. Um, but I remember at the time, um, mm. There was a big push for, hey, there's this great new product coming out called DSL, right? And mm -hmm. now here we are all the way up in the future um, where it's not even, you know, it's seamless. You don't even know if you're using DSL or, right. or you're using cable modem or what technology lies under that. Which it's not nice. in your house and you don't even have to plug anything into it anymore. You just have like, you know, on your phone, find the Wi-Fi network, turn it on. And you, yeah. and you know no it right like it's just really simple and easy and yeah. that's the way things are going to go for networking you know of the future as well yeah you go to your router and you just press a button and you connect yep plug it in connect it and then all devices in the house just find the wi-fi network and you put in your password and yeah. boom you're away yeah just don't change the password i've done that it, it takes a few hours to go reset everything <laughs> I, 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 like i'm a suburban dad with three daughters so i love oh. the password it's really fun to watch what happens yeah, that's true. You, hey, you can hold hey, your heads. So yeah. I'm going to date myself now. We'll see. If, I used to work on SNA. If you remember SNA from IBM? Holy cow. Uh, when, so, you know, it's, it's almost like we're talking about COBOL right now. You know, like, remember how it was going on now with uh, all the, the uh, state systems that haven't been updated since forever. So how long, I mean, I don't want you to date yourself too bad, but how long ago was that? Probably back in the early 80s, I would think. Early to mid, you know, late 80s. And, and, and I've had people call me and say they're looking for COBOL programmers because I did, I did program in COBOL for a few years. I actually was an assembler programmer too. That's it. I, I, well, right now I imagine there's a super hot market for COBOL <laughs> because I, I, I was reading about how uh, all the um, 
in certain states, especially in the South, the unemployment systems that were built mm -hmm. way back then are still the systems that are being used. And nobody's been trained on that in, mm -hmm. you know, since then, since the early 80s, really. You know, I can tell you that the state of California's system is a mainframe. Oh, wow. So, uh, and I know they're looking for COBOL programming. So there's a little plug out for you. I'm, I'm actually thinking of doing some part-time work in it because, you know, it's, it's been a long time, but you know. I'm not going to make a mint right now. I know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have, you said you're, you're fully remote. Um, so it's not like you all of a sudden decide to do it one day. What did you have to do to, I mean, how did you even decide that? And how did you make it work? Um, you know, so... The company until the latter part of last year was really only around 25, oh. 30. So you're grown. Um, yeah, we've grown quite a bit. We, we had a new round of funding uh, that closed in December of last year. Uh, I actually only joined the company in January of this year. Oh, wow. Uh, but the, I can say this from, an, from being an employee standpoint, it was probably the most seamless uh, onboarding process I've ever dealt with because, you know, it was like, here's everything that you need to do is right here in this portal, go fill it out right now. And then, and then all, all the, you know, uh, W4s and um, proof of uh, that I'm a human being and that I'm an American citizen or that I'm authorized to work in the United States. All those things were just right there for me on a sheet that I could do myself, send those in. And a couple of days later, a laptop came to me in the mail and, um, I opened it, had everything I needed already loaded on it. Uh, it's really not much different than what um, happened, you know, my first day at Facebook or Square, but I didn't have to sit in a room all day and do all of these things while, while someone watched or handed, you know, and everyone had their um, IT systems being tested and checked out. I could do all that at my own pace. Yeah. Uh, and it was really simple, you know. Um, I think... Um, I don't know that we'll ever go to the fact where we have a sort of centralized headquarters. Um, I know for now that we have no plans of doing that. And since I've joined, actually, um, there's been more than 20 other people that have come into the company. Wow. Um, and, and, and throughout all this, there's never been talk of where's our, where's our office going to be. Everyone is actually, uh, there's a certain kind of person I think right now that's detracted to this type of work. Mm -hmm. And, Tech really lends itself to that. Obviously, you know, you can you can code or you can negotiate business contracts or you can mm -hmm. uh, research facilities that you need to deploy uh, data centers and all that. You can do all of that on the internet. So it makes just sense to do it where you are. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. And so you you never went to? Did you go to a building for an interview or was it all remote? It was all remote. I actually did all my interviews right here in this room. Uh, on my personal laptop on a different, you know, on Zoom. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. That's great. And it, was, and it was, a, you know, the best, the, the most um, disconcerting thing about these kind of uh, interviews is when um, people left their uh, cameras off mm. and it was just like a disembodied voice talking to me. I, I kept thinking about, you remember Buck Rogers, that show yes. back in the day? And there was that robot walking around, beep, 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 beep. And there's the other one who would talk like he was uh, a, a scientist or whatever. And, yeah. and some of my interviews felt like that. And I asked, can you please turn your camera on just for a minute so that I know that you're a human being and, you know, like, mm -hmm. so I can see you. But, but after that, we both would just turn our cameras off because it really didn't matter. You know, it was the content of the discussion that was important. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's, that's really cool. So the, the ongoing pandemic has forced a lot of companies to go remote. Um, you already were remote, so did did that cause any challenges that you didn't expect, or it was a pretty seamless? The biggest challenge for me as a remote worker in the pandemic is dealing with the fact that everybody else is home all day, every day. Yes. Um, like, you know, uh, I've had meetings that I've been on that one of my children just comes out and walks into, you know, they're used to coming out here. I have comic books and movies and all these things out here in, in the, what I call the study because mm -hmm. Gabe doesn't sound smart enough. So I call it the study <laughs> I'm out here in the study that I've built out in the garage. They'll come out and uh, you know, uh, Oh, Hey dad, can you give me like uh, hold on a second? Dad's actually working right here. You know, yeah. this is where I work every day. Yeah. It's funny. Then, 
I think the, I've talked to a bunch of people about this. The most, it's really the most trying for people with little kids because the little kids don't understand the difference. If you're home, you're daddy. Oh. Yeah, my, you see, my, my brother and sister-in-law um, who don't work from home regularly, they have four-year-old twins. Oh. And, you know, it's like there's I, – I talk to them. We FaceTime. Obviously, we're not hanging out right now, but FaceTime. And I can just see on their, the looks on their face like, uh, can you keep talking to him for a minute so I can um, go actually answer this email that I've been trying to get to since 6 a.m.? You know, it's like yeah. – I can't imagine, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that uh, right now in this current what's going on is that we all have to be kind and we have yeah. to be forgiving of ourselves as well. Because, yeah. you know, like I just see the pressure that some people put on themselves to yeah. deliver in a way that they're not used to. And it's like, it's going to take a minute. This, this wasn't, I didn't jump into this and everything made sense day one. Yeah, um, no, I know. Yeah. It took, it took a few months before I learned how to actually organize a day and work remotely because that's yeah. that's another thing you don't have like um you know when you're in an office and facebook it's a big open area right we all would sit around tables and you'd notice when it was lunchtime mm -hmm. because people start standing up like oh shoot it's time to go to go eat food when you're working at home you, and you're you're in a room by yourself and you're just diving into your laptop and you're not paying much attention to anything else other than what's right in front of you in that moment because you, you do have to train yourself to do that especially because there's a lot of there can be a lot of distractions at home you forget, like you might look up and go, oh, geez, it's 2.30 and I didn't have lunch yet. Or, or it's five o'clock and, right. and yeah. I didn't eat, I ate breakfast at 5 a.m. or, you know, whatever the situation might be. Um, and I think the interesting thing for me is what I've really started to do is that I have two calendars. I have a calendar that's my work calendar and then I have another calendar that's on my phone that's just my personal calendar. And on my personal calendar, I put everything in there that mm -hmm. needs to happen throughout the day that isn't a meeting because I don't want people to uh, see on my, on my calendar work calendar that there's these meetings and they don't feel like they can schedule something then, but it's, but, um, but they can, you know, mm -hmm. like so it open on that calendar, but my other calendar has, okay, get up and go for a walk for 15 minutes right now. Mm -hmm. uh, go remember to go eat lunch, right? It's 1145. You should go eat lunch. Yes. Um, it's six o'clock. You should be in the house with your family right now. Yeah. which um, is kind of like the sort of things that that that's another adjustment that I had to make as I was learning how to work from home. Yeah, I actually myself, um, you know, basically where I live, I, I do my best. I don't do it every day, but I really try to walk down to the bay. I'm three minutes from the San Francisco Bay. Yeah, I try to just walk down there twice a day and just because, you know, there's days when it's just it's just so beautiful. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, like today is a perfect example. Like I was, I I went outside just before we started this chat for the first time in a couple hours, and it was just like, holy cow! It's a gorgeous day. It's around 65, 70 degrees out, and you know where I live in the East Bay, you know it can get super hot here. Yeah. Where you live, you have nature's air conditioner right there. We have a hills, a range of hills in between us and that. Yeah. So on days like this, it's just like, man, I would just sit at a table in my backyard and work if I could. But yeah. That's was very productive either but I do do that sometimes actually I do sometimes just sit outside and enjoy the weather and, and do what I have to do we are so lucky in the Bay Area I don't you know like it's so that I've been so many places those of us who work in technology and have work at global companies I've been to many different countries a lot of you know I think I've been on every continent that's inhabited by people um, mm -hmm. except for Australia and in all of those instances i've never found a place that is like this place you know as far as what the weather's like and yeah. i agree so i've lived here for 20 years now and i have never once complained about the weather yeah that's right it's hard to complain it, it just amazes me when you see people in parkas and scarves it's like come on <laughs> right 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 no my favorite is when i worked in san francisco every day i'd get off bart and it, um because of the the microclimates i get it right like you end mm -hmm. up with uh, San Francisco really can be morning is winter, uh, yeah. you know, afternoon, uh, lunchtime is spring. Um, and then we have autumn around 4.30 p.m. when the wind comes in off the ocean. Yeah. And then you get back to uh, winter again, unless it's October, because then it's summer all day long, which is so right. weird. Right? Yep. <laughs> favorite month here. <laughs> yep, yep. So, so there are companies like Gaber that help develop, build, and scale products, especially for startups. How important do you think that's going to be in the future for companies like yourself that you're in a growth mode, that you need yeah. to hire people now, and you need to hire the, the 
right people, not just anybody. Yeah, and actually, you know, the thing that I've learned, even at, uh, you know, going through places like Facebook and Square uh, and Dropbox, Dropbox, I was there a little bit later um, in, in the company's evolution, but early on, you can really, a bad hire can really sink um, if not your company, it can sink your team um, mm -hmm. really easily. Um, and so I, I, I definitely believe, um, I think, you know, when you see things like uh, Uber and Lyft and people talk about the uh, jobs of the future being these sort of like scrappy um, 1099 type people, I think the same thing will evolve as far as into companies, right? Corporations are going to be small and there's going to be a lot of them that are that are going to grow from from nothing and that sort of, that that er, those early um, years are so critical I, I think you know one of the things that i tell people when they ask me oh so what's the difference between working at a startup and working at a at a big company it's like well there's several several layers of difference between those two there's not you know it's not that straight up and simple um but you know an early uh, i was at Square when I really considered it a startup and, and that was every six weeks our product strategy would change mm -hmm. uh, dramatically you know like one one six week period we are uh, we had our credit card reader and that was sort of our um, base level of revenue that was going to keep us going and then um, we would always be trying to find what's the next set of revenue that's really going to drive our business and at one point it was, we're going to be the social payments company. Well, we went somewhere for a few weeks with that and Venmo was already kind of jumping in that space. And so we got into a fight, you know, like a fight with Venmo. So, okay, now we need to really find what another um, avenue is going to be because that's not going to be as big. And um, so in those early days, if you don't have people who can think nimbly and um, <laughs> jump from context switch to context switch and they don't need the roadmap laid out in front of them, um, but there's definitely thing, there's there's tool sets that you need as well that that uh, you, I, I think one of the things that a lot of startups do is they build everything like whether it's a trouble reporting system for internally or whatever it is they're working on all of these things um, uh, at the same time and it's an opportunity cost right there's there's that part of thing that people need to think about is uh, we see this in the debate between uh, cloud and owned infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. Like some people are built only in cloud, but at a certain point in time, it makes uh, um, it makes cost sense to build your own infrastructure where it used to be the exact opposite. Everybody was building their own infrastructure. And in the early days um, of a company, if you're thinking about building your own infrastructure versus putting something in the cloud, that those salaries that you're spending on people who are building these internal tools for you are not is not money that you're spending on your core product. Right. So those are those are the kind of decisions that early startups think about a lot, and and that um, outside companies can help them with. Yeah, well, your your company is an example, uh, and and I'll give you an example. When I first came here, I came from the corporate world, a major northeastern bank, uh, went to a startup, and I was I was the DBA, I was the database administrator, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing, and all of a sudden we we were trying to transition from a SMB company to an enterprise, you know, start to get enterprise customers. And somebody got um, Verizon to do a proof of concept with us and a pilot. And all of a sudden the CEO tasked me on the shoulder. Um, you're now the sales engineer. <laughs> You've got to be in New York in, you know, this time next Monday. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know that feeling. That was that was my first day at Square. Can you be in Japan next week? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can. <laughs> the technology <laughs> exists there. <laughs> <getting me there. laughs> so, hey, Jeff, this has been a lot of fun today. I really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, hopefully, we'll meet after this is all over. And I, and I really want to thank you for your time today and sharing some of your insights with us. Pleasure is all mine. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day.